my first week in the building about a year ago, I went down to the courtyard for the first time. And uh, I didn't look too good, you know? It was a Sunday morning. That's my least presentable hour. <laughs> There's a lot of, you know, just stains, just like, you know, food and me and whatever. And so I'm, si I'm sitting there. So, shut up. <laughs> oh. Anyway, but so there I was. I'm sitting on the stone bench of this courtyard and uh, feeling a little out of place. You know, there's these fancy doormen and stuff. And then there's this guy looking at me. I notice he's looking at me from across the courtyard. And he's all spiffy looking. He's got brown shoes and he's looking at me like, hmm. I could tell he was thinking I don't live in the building. He thinks I just wandered in off the street and sat in a courtyard. I could tell he's thinking of coming over and dealing with me on his own. And I'm sitting there thinking like, oh, please do that. Yes, please, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. And I'm trying to look even more gross. And I'm like <laughs> pulling up my shirt. And, and then I see him go, oh, no, that's not going to do at all. And he comes over to me. Hmm. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm so excited to have this thing. The confrontation where I'm not wrong at all. And he thinks I am. So he comes over, says, uh, excuse me, do you live in this building? And I said, no. Because <laughs> why not start there? I said, no. He goes, well, then what are you doing here? And I said, I just need to rest. I'm having a hard time. He says, this is private property. And I said, well, I don't really believe in that. <laughs> you know, just the worst things I could say from his point of view is basically all the things I was saying. And he goes, well, if you don't leave, I'm going to talk to the doorman. I was like, can I just stay like five more hours? <laughs> so he's, hmm, no. And he goes over to the doorman. And I see him talking about me to the doorman like this. And then I see the doorman going, oh, no, that guy lives here. That's OK. <laughs> And the look on his face, it was just so, it was a, this beautiful cocktail of anger and confusion. It's like I had an invented a new way to hurt somebody's feelings. That's, that's how excited I was. He was so angry, he came back, he came back to me. He said, why didn't you tell me that you live here? And I said, because I don't have to tell you anything ever. <laughs> there are no words that I must say to you. Also, I didn't want to ruin your thing. That's your favorite thing you were doing. You love that. Making people not be places. Also, I make more than you. I just don't give a shit about myself. <laughs> anyway, he didn't say anything after that because, uh, well, the whole thing didn't really happen. <laughs> I mean, well, it's, it's not true, but it's as, it's as true as anything that does happen. I mean, <laughs> really, anytime anybody says anything to me, I decide what they said anyway. <laughs> the, the truth of this story, and I won't lie to you again, but here's what really happened. I was sitting in the courtyard looking like shit, that's true, and the guy was looking at me, but then the rest of it I just made up in my head, just, <laughs> just an angry, hateful, Rich dick, you probably want to kick me out. And then here's what I would say, and then you would do this, and then I would say these three really cool things right in a row. And of course, he set me up for all of them because I'm him too. It's kind of hard to lose an argument when you're both people and it's taking place in your brain. And then in reality, he really did come up to me. 
And he said, are you new to the building? And I said, yeah, I just moved here. And he said, oh, welcome. He was so nice. He was incredibly nice. And he's been, for the last year, he's my favorite person in the world. He's George, my neighbor George. He's probably watching. I love George. He's the greatest. Some woman, right, who, um, the sort of bedroom is on par to our kitchen, right? Yeah. So I'm sort of washing up. Yeah. And I sort of look across and see see this woman with, uh, like, you know, no no pants on and that, no, no bra and that. Naked? Yeah, just... That's the word you're looking for. Yeah, yeah, yeah she's just wandering about, you know, on that. So I was like, oh, what's going on here? So I kept, carried on washing up and that, right? And uh, <laughs> kept looking, and then I was looking and she looked at me. Right, so we made eye contact. <laughs> sure. So I was like, oh, God, right? So um, what I thought the best thing to do was, was sort of drop me pants a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> just just a little bit, just like, you know, I had boxer shorts on and that. I thought if I just show a little bit of little bit of sort of arse cheek, then it's kind of like, right, we, we quits. Right? <laughs> I don't understand the thinking. <laughs> so, so Suzanne's watching the telly, right? I think she was watching Sex in the City or something. Yeah. She sort of turns around to see how I'm getting on with the washing up, right? She sees me with, like, my pants sort of down a little bit with my arse out. She said, what are you doing? I said, don't look now. I said, but there's a woman over the road, right? We know pants on and that. She caught me looking. I'm just giving her a bit back. <laughs> I love the fact that he explains the rules and Suzanne's meant to go, OK. <laughs> that makes sense. But I don't, so, so hang on, so you, you, you showed a bit of your arse. You turned, presumably, to show the arse. Or well, I just, the arse I just, at the I had to lift it up a little bit on the, sort of, on the draining board. What, hang on though, what, um, what did she do? Did you register her reaction when she saw a bit of your arse? What happened? When she saw my arse? Yeah. Well, then I wasn't looking because I thought, in a way, I don't want, I don't want it to look like, well, I've seen a bit of your stuff, here's a bit of mine. <laughs> I just <laughs> thought, at the end of the day, I caught a glance of you. It's only fair. You've had a bit back. You know, I'm not you making see, a big I, deal out I of it. I genuinely think James Stewart missed a trick here in Rear Window. Yeah. This would have been, you know, a much better film had James Stewart just popped his pants down. It would have given a whole new meaning to the, to the title Rear Window. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, everybody. This would be f I used to live here in Los Angeles on Sierra Bonita. And I had an apartment. And I had a name. And whenever he would knock on my wall, I wanted to turn my music on. And that made me angry because I like. Go around. <laughs> I cannot open the wall. I don't know if you have a doorknob on the other side, but over here there's nothing. <laughs> it's just flat. I will give you an example of how race affects my life, okay? I live in a place called Alpine, New Jersey. I live in Alpine, New Jersey, right? My house costs millions of dollars. Don't hate the player, hate the game. In my neighborhood, there are four black people. Hundreds of houses, four black people. Who are these black people? Well, it's me, Mary J. Blige, Jay-Z, and Eddie Murphy. Only black people in the whole neighborhood. So let, let, let's break it down, let's break it down. Me, I, I'm a decent comedian, I'm all right. Uh, Mary J. Blige, Mary J. Blige, one of the greatest R&B singers to ever walk the earth. Jay-Z, one of the greatest rappers to ever live. Eddie Murphy, one of the funniest actors to ever, ever do it. Do you know what the white man that lives next door to me does for a living? He's a fucking dentist. <laughs> He ain't the best dentist in the world. He ain't going to the Dental Hall of Fame. He don't get plaques for getting rid of plaques. He's just a yank your tooth out.
You feel? Let me tell you about a story so true. But show me style and it's all so cool. It's about a garment torn and frayed. Getting this brand, the story conveyed. Walking down the streets with holes in my teeth. These rip things here, part of me you see. It ain't about the brand or the label it holds. It's about the journey, the stories it unfolds. In these ragged clothes, I find my voice. A testament to resilience. My choice from the streets to the stage. I rock my style in my tattered shirt. I walk that mile. Ripped and torn, but still I stand in my ragged attire. I command it's not just fabric, it's a statement. I preach in my threadbare garment, I find my reach. From the barrio to the bar, I make my mark. In my worn out jeans, I leave a spark. And they call it rags, but I call it art. And every stitch and tear, I play my part. It's the struggle of the streets, the hustle so real. In my tattered jacket, I seal the deal. A symbol of defiance against the status quo. My passion, the pants, I let it show. It's not about the riches or the wealth I lack. In my faded hoodie, I stay on track. It's the heart of the hustle, the grind each day. In my worn out kips, I find my way. Ripped and torn, but still I stand. In my ragged attire. Command. It's not just fabric, it's a statement I preach. In my threadbare garment, I find my reach. So here's to the ones with the clothes that tear in our patched up attire. We have so let the world see our garments worn. For in our rags, our stories are born. In the language of the streets, we speak. In our torn up clothes, we find our peak. Out Dennis. See, the black man got to fly to get something that the white man can walk to. Right, baby. Shit, I had to make miracles happen to get that house. I had to host the Oscars to get that house. And, and to this day, I don't even believe it's my house. That's why I keep a bag packed right by the door. Just in case the white people that really own the place show up one day. Time to go, blackhead. Damn, I knew this day would come. Good thing I'm packed. Do you know what a black dentist would have to do to move into my neighborhood? He'd have to invent teeth. 